So we're back here in the garage. We're with um, a special guest here is actually <laughs> special. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, Seth Brown, not Seth Fox. So Seth Brown is wheel with Ultra Four in a little bit. Uh, we're bringing him, him on the board with Recoil as a director of operations. So introduce yourself. Who are you? So uh, I'm an Army veteran, uh, served in Afghanistan. Uh, my background in the off-road industry is I grew up in it. Uh, I, I'm actually uh, wearing a, this is the club I grew up in around here in the city, the front tour four-wheelers. Uh, most of my family still wheel. Um, buggies, mostly now, everyone's big. I'm, I'm in a four-door JK, but uh, I went to school at Wild Tech. I'm a welder fabricator mechanic and uh, been in the industry most of my adult life working at uh, shop building drag cars. Some of those vehicles have been on um, a little show you may have heard called um, Street Outlaws. Ooh, yeah. yeah, I think uh, that rings a bell. Worked on some of those. Uh, I've uh, volunteered at Ultra 4 races as uh, like recovery and track crew. And uh, this past year and a half, uh, I've worked at a couple of races with uh, JT Taylor as the race director. I, uh, heck, my first job was at a drag strip in Noble. Uh, my first job was doing the ET shack. Like we take a pass and after we hand out the tickets, that yeah. was, I was that guy for a little bit. And then I ran the staging lanes and the water box and was a starter a couple times, you know? Um, so that, I think that that was with my background growing up, being around it and then working on the drag strip and stuff, it helped me, I guess, figure out I wanted to be, uh, like a part of helping events and helping other people do this stuff in the future. Um, I don't have the money to, to race my so, own vehicle and stuff. So, uh, so you've been in Oklahoma pretty much all your life. Yes. Besides like going to Wyoming for school or going overseas. Yeah. I've been here my, oh, my entire life. So you mentioned you're a veteran real quick. Um, what branch? Army. So, Army. Infantry. Infantry. Yeah. Okay. Hmm. Yeah. Hey, <laughs> hey, at least I'm not a Marine, so you don't have to worry about cranes. <laughs> yeah, okay, fair. Um, okay, so that, that's easy enough. Um, it's you, you've you been around it. How old are you now? Like, I'm, I just turned 35. So uh, my family's been <laughs> wheeling my entire life. I uh, My dad's first rig, up in, and he wheeled it up until within the last 10 years was a CJ5. Yeah. Yeah. So I grew up in a CJ5. I've been at Little Sahara in the back, buried to my chest uh, in sand, uh, while my dad's on like a precarious position on a dune, trying not to slide into some trees. And finally, he looks back at me and he's like, why, why are you yelling? And sees I'm buried in my chest. He goes, all right, I guess we'll pull winch now. You know, like, <laughs> <laughs> you worked hard enough, I guess. <laughs> That's awesome. Heck yeah. Um, so we know recoil and the benefit that it can have on uh, veterans, what, what we're kind of aiming for. Um, I've discussed what it does for me and the, the healing it provides me, but as coming on with recoil and uh, doing what we've talked about, what is it that you think recoil can provide you? So I love just talking about this world, um, you know, say motorsports in general. And, but specifically off-road is what I've grown up around the most and I have the most experience with. So, uh, if I can guide somebody in, here's some parts you might look at or look at this company because I know they're good. They, they're made in the USA parts or, Hey, uh, you know, do you want to go on a ride? You know, let's see what it's about. That's a big thing for me uh, is just helping somebody get into something that they might like. And then on the other side of it is like-minded individuals that want to do something similar uh, and work together. Like we're sitting here with this vehicle, you know, like just working on this is gets the same feeling as being on the trail sometimes. You know, the end goal is to be on the trail, but getting there is a big portion of the journey. And, and if I can help somebody get there, uh, you know, that's almost as good as wheeling with them on the trail. Yep. Yep. That, that's fair. Um, man, I, I've got to say like, it's, it's a tough one just getting on the trail. And sometimes like you're in your freaking head when you're working on these things. But like you said, sometimes it's like you're on the trail and you're having a blast or you can be working on this and still be having a blast, especially when you're around people 
mm-hmm. they're like minded, doing the same shit. Especially if like I don't know anything, or I, I know <laughs> I know things. I don't know everything. Is what I'm right, gonna say. Right. Uh, but there's people that I know aren't as technically minded, but they still bring up ideas that, yeah. what if we do it this way? And it's a good perspective to have uh, different people from different backgrounds and mix that together. And you, you come up with some really good, good ideas that way. I was going to say, this thing, I had no idea what I was doing. Like, I know I've grown up around mechanics and, you know, all the nonsense, but I've never, like, built my own. And having this has been, like, a huge major insight to a lot of stuff that's, like, show me different methods of getting stuff done. I know everything we're doing with this thing. People are like, oh, you could do it this way even better. Well, okay, maybe, but this is how I know how to do it. Well, and also, do better do doesn't mean it's the way you feel comfortable with or what right, you can right. afford either. You know, I, I like to give, like, when I give advice, like, levels of cost. Yeah. Here's your basic way to do it here's a little bit more and then here's a really high end you know like pick what you can afford or save up until you can't afford what you want you know absolutely um so a big role that you've got on with recoil is um a safety guy so let's dive into a little bit of safety i want you to nitpick this what would you change on this and when it when you start getting into some stuff like the seat belts and harnesses i know we're not up to date um there's like a rating form uh, uh they're dated so yeah they're rated not all of them are rated you can get harnesses that aren't rated but they have a date on them and sun so uv light breaks them down breaks down this material just like a synthetic winch line so somewhere on here there'll be a t- sfi tag so do you know what sfi stands for because i don't it is um Safety Federation International or something like that. There's SFI and then... Super freaking inconvenient. Something like that. <laughs> and then um, there's... So SFI is American only. The other one is... Oh, I cannot think of the name of it. But there's another safety standard that most of the world covers. Okay. So a lot of race organizations in the United States will cover SFI and the other one. I can't think of what it is right now. Uh, but they will look at both uh, because they do overlap. But if you want to be able to race worldwide, you need to look at the other safety standard because it's what like Formula One, uh, WRC, all of them okay. race with. Right, right. Uh, where's your oh. So there'll be a tag on here and it'll have a date and uh, it'll be like So if stamped. it doesn't have a tag, it's probably not. <laughs> If it doesn't have a tag and you were to try to use this in an event, uh, they wouldn't let you do it if they're actually checking your stuff. And that's the right, thing right. is you if they're actually the check out. Yeah. yeah. Like, how, but it doesn't even have dates. Also within that, they will be looking at um, wear and tear. So if you have a perfectly up-to-date seatbelt, but it's got a cut right here or holes in it from welding, um, that's a no-go because it might be a month old, but it's, it, it's damaged. Okay. So I'll preface the Waggy is currently ongoing several updates. Um, we only have lap, lap belts mounted. I don't even think the passenger seat has a lap belt. Yeah, it's not even mounted. So yeah, it's not even on this side. The passenger so seat has belts. It's just not mounted. The driver's seat only has a lap belt lap belt mounted. Look at that one because they're in a standard spot usually. So I feel like this is a good option to kind of see what the standard should be. Or should not be, I guess. Well, the big thing is know your equipment. Like, if you can't easily move your adjuster, uh, it needs to be cleaned or replaced. Like, I can move that, but I can't pull the belt easily. So that means somebody's not going to be able to get in your vehicle and easily adjust it to their size. But, yeah, I'm not seeing a tag on these. Oh, here we go. It's right here. So there is a tag. This is dated June of 2012. Oh, so these belts are out of date for a race organization. Now for a wheeler, that doesn't necessarily mean they're not safe. If the material's in good condition, it's not heavily faded, um, everything works well, it doesn't stick when you go to like you can easily move it around, adjust it. 
I'm not saying you need to follow the same specs for wheeling, but a good habit to get into, make sure your stuff is clean and yeah. If you, know, if you have a rig that is open top and it sits outside in your driveway when you're not wheeling and these get faded really, really bad. Yeah. Replace them because the it's breaking down this synthetic fiber mm -hmm. and it's, it's not, it doesn't have the same properties it did before. Right. It, and this is all stuff that I very well could be misstating certain things. I want to, state that too yeah you're, you're not a, a certified safety guy yeah but in my experience that's what a lot of things they look for you know okay. um but i forget the date but for different organizations it's you have so many years after the date it's stamped and that date it's stamped is when it's manufactured oh, okay. so you could get some belts on clearance from summit jags or something and they have, they're on clearance because they've been sitting on the shelf for two years and they only have like one year of life left to be legal same with helmets do that too they have yeah. a rating on it and it's a date rating and you're you're kind of screwed if you buy it not knowing that thinking you've got brand new belts in which you do but they've been in the box and the date is almost out of date gotcha gotcha um so what about seats is there anything seat wise that so is good safety just keep in mind kind of thing um containment not like necessarily a containment seat even though those are good but they're not as comfortable mm -hmm. but something that's going to keep your butt positioned like what a lot of people don't think of is and even not running lap or they're only running lap belts not running shoulder belts or running shoulder belts that are loose well over a day of wheeling you're using your entire body to hold yourself in the seat instead of using the seat and the harnesses to hold you in. So your body's going to fatigue, get tired. And in a, in a wreck or an incident that a rollover or something, you want your body to move as little as possible because it's that initial movement and then that sudden stop where a lot of injuries happen. So it's not as comfortable when you first start, mm -hmm. but once you start strapping in right, it gets easy like yeah you're not leaning out the window to spot i mean and in those instances you can loosen it up you know lean out but you know be safe be smart um the those small moments where you might loosen something up so you can see better it's fine as long as you then tighten it back up in my opinion um you know you could look at it from a racing standpoint and be like no it always needs to be tight in the real world that doesn't always work for and most people won't do that but Look, be smart about it because there's way too many videos out there of people being ejected out of a vehicle and barely missing. Pretty sure I just saw crushed. one the day of a gladiator, a guy wasn't strapped in and rolled and came out of the roof. Like the, he only had yes. the keys off uh, and he, it, it came he just falls over him. Yeah, and he came and out he, of it. He stood right back up I'm like, holy cow. There's another video that's been going around where the, uh, it rolled over towards the driver's side and he didn't have doors on. He stuck his leg out like he was going to stop it and it uh, folded his leg backwards and then it rolled over and he got partially ejected out of it, you know? So uh, there's okay. there's way too many instances of people getting hurt for simple things as even a lap belt. I, mm -hmm. I suggest run more than a lap belt, but at least that's going to keep you from coming out of the vehicle. It's not going to keep you from hitting your A pillar, your roll cage, your steering wheel or anything. But right. I mean, it's better than nothing. Exactly. And that was the big reason why I put the uh, the lap belt in at minimum. But as far as the, the shoulder harnesses go, so... I've heard mixed things, and it's a big topic of discussion that a lot of people have, um, or that not a lot of people, a few people have. So when you're sitting in here, say your shoulder's right about right here, where do you want your harness set? So that would work for this. If you're taller and your shoulders are up here, you don't want to use these holes. You want the shoulder straps to come pretty much straight back the, the shoulders are not to hold you down in the seat that's what the lap belts are for that's why they you want them at a like a 45 degree angle from your hip because that's what's actually holding you down and back in the seat your shoulders are just keeping your tor your upper torso from coming forward so you also don't want to pre-compress your spine so if these have a pretty downward angle from your shoulder down and you tighten those down well it's now compressing your spine it's taking that cushion out of your um your discs and you say you do bottom out it's going to hurt even more because your spine your body doesn't have its natural ability to absorb that shock as well because you've pre-compressed it so most manufacturers say like uh, they want straight back or like no more than like 10 degrees down um, I have seen some where they, they actually show an upward angle 
and so there's... like your shoulders are sitting down here versus yeah like, like if if this is if your shoulders are right here mm -hmm. that's fine if your shoulders are up here like that's not a good angle also because if say your your shoulder harnesses mount uh up here mm -hmm. so then now your belt's coming down through the seat back up uh anywhere that you want this to pull in a straight line because anything else around it, if it bends it or something, now you got slack. And also you want it as short of a span as possible. Like I've seen guys do drag uh, drag cars, road race cars, drift cars, and they've got these seat belts mounted all the way back where the back like seat would be. Here, yeah. Well, the longer this material is, the more stretchy it. So you want this as short as possible mounted uh, because you want to eliminate as much of that stretch as possible. Yeah. Um, so a lot of seats where the shoulder harnesses are don't necessarily mean that's the only place you can run it that's also why they have these loops here so you can run through and your harness won't fall through fall out uh some seats will have multiple holes in them like uh kirkies like aluminum like you can go and you can cut new ones whatever but look look at what your harnesses are going to be set up as and if you're building a new cage design that harness bar into that it's not just a horizontal bar it for say for structure it's also to mount these two and if if that's too low then you need to add another bar or another mounting point to get this where it needs to be because just because it's there doesn't mean you have to use it right right um if you buy a rig and it's already got a cage in it and these shoulder belts aren't going to be where they need to be like come up with a solution, get it where they need to be because um, it's not only for you, it's anybody that gets in your vehicle. Uh, you've put them in a vehicle that you own, whether you design the cage or not. If you if you know that they're, it's not right, make it right. Yep, yep, I'm with you there. Um, but like these, I, I know you're limited in foot room, but if you didn't run harness, shoulder harnesses in this, um, I think you'd be kind of stupid because of where you're at with this right here yeah and there's yep. no padding or anything on it at this point even if you have a helmet um like you want to keep these on because you don't want your shoulders coming over and your head hitting this and a lot of vehicles that's that's inevitable just because of the you, you didn't design the vehicle you're make you're moving stuff around in it right but yeah this vehicle would and even my jeep uh like when i sit in there like my beam pillars right there you know you want you want to be able to keep your body from going over and hitting that. And these shoulder belts are going to be the prime example of what's going to keep you from doing that. Mm -hmm. Cool. cool. Um, so let's talk fire extinguishers. Um, the one that's loosely mounted right there. <laughs> loosely. I mean, it's just sitting there. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it does show a full charge. <laughs> Is there a date on it? Some of them have dates, but I mean, a properly mounted fire extinguisher that you can get out of, you can, get out of the mount easily quickly and is within reach of the driver and or passenger if it can reach if the driver can reach up the passenger can't and you're knocked out it doesn't really do anybody good um if there's a fire and then now they're trapped in the vehicle so make it to where it's in reach of both people or one that's in reach of both people um and the size and the type I, like there's a b there's class classes a b c and others uh and you need to know like what your fire extinguisher is rated at doing like if it'll do chemicals if it'll do fuel right all that if, if it's a dry chemical if it's a uh, halon whatever because there's pros and cons to a lot of them some of these chemicals take uh, oxygen out of the environment and if you're in that environment that it takes oxygen out of in a closed cockpit you might suffocate to death mm -hmm. uh, there's some where it'll get sprayed on your engine and then it's it's caustic it'll corrode stuff well that's might be good to get the fire out but then now you got to clean this up or you're ruining hoses and lines and anodizing and paint, you know. And rebuild a $60,000 motor. Yeah. <laughs> um, there's... Shut up, wanted to get in. I guess so. There's uh, there's element fire extinguishers, which are kind of like a flare. And I've, I've seen them work and I've seen them not work very well. Yeah. And it's... Also, I, they're, they're not cheap either. They're... Close to a hundred dollars, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, I could be wrong, Make and uh, it, oh, she's fine. it come here. be kind of expensive to. Oh, oh my god! 
like on your <laughs> like on your own to test it on something and see if it works because I mean that's that's a decent chunk of money for most people coming out of their pocket. Yep. So get something that you're familiar with, that you're comfortable with, and that you know will work for your application. And there's other options out there. I showed y'all some. There are these uh, these tubes that have pressurized. Um, uh, fire retardant in it and you can mount it anywhere and when it sees sees direct flame or heat uh, it melts that tube and where that it melts it at it turns it into a spray nozzle and that's kind of a set it and forget it kind of deal yeah uh, there's there's ways to get fire suppression in your vehicle that aren't going to break the bank uh use nascar parts are a big thing you know there's warehouses out um north carolina in that area where they buy out teams use parts and teams that are shutting down and uh seems like the research I've done, they got a lot of stuff coming in and out, so they don't list everything they got. But you call them and say, hey, do you got a fire suppression system? And they'll you know, tell you what they got, you know, how many nozzles, what kind, if it's serviceable, if it's not. And you might be able to get some, you know, half the price of a brand new one and it still be perfectly functional. Dang, I need to look into doing that. Yeah, right. it's like <laughs> uh, big crazy radiators that NASCAR guys run. Yeah. They're probably, you know, four or five thousand dollar radiators maybe you know with built-in heat exchangers for other things and you can get them for a fraction of that and they make great off-road radiators because they're very robust and they have all these other coolers in them and uh yeah it, it it's fun just to look at it like go yeah. through when you can find a list of stuff and see man i, I could use this like this i could use it like that you know and right. if you can get a hold of it it's and actually compare it to what something is brand new it's pretty inexpensive because you know they put dates or like a uh, life like shelf life yeah on oh, parts like all right we'll, we'll run a brake caliper for one race and then it goes in the trash and they put a new brake caliper yeah. on it. Mm -hmm. so you've got you you can get a brake caliper like a willwood bear you know high-end brake caliper that has one race on it and uh that's it they took it off not because it was broke or anything it's just the the life that they use it for is is that it has like, such fine tolerances yeah for their and it, it's not worth them running it again and then uh, say a o-ring goes out or something yeah. they, they just put a new one Calipers a thousand dollars whereas if your brakes fail race cars two three hundred yeah. thousand well and you miss out on a million dollar payday because you yep. didn't win the race or something true yeah yep. us playing in the dirt those are perfect mm -hmm. <laughs> i'm pretty sure i've got one back here that's not even operational with all the fluid that's on it right now so Oof. but i've got three that work <laughs> no i'll be fixing that um we don't, don't be saying that to the safety guy <laughs> yeah. um see what else safety wise when you're done roasting the wagyu you might have to go light up the tj oh yeah oh, tj's bad <laughs> it's i know the seat belts are bad because i've put them on and they're they hold you in the seat, but they're warm. The old redneck death. Well, I mean, yeah. so here other little things. Like if you're sitting in here and your legs are flopping around, what are they going to hit, you know? Um, little things like that. Because even going throughout a day on the trail and you're bouncing around on the rocks, like are you are you going to be hitting your knee on this? Are you going to be hitting your, your knees on this bouncing around? You know, like little things like that. And being aware of it, thinking about it, and – you know, put some padding on some of this stuff. Uh, if, if you got holes in your floor, you know, patch them up so you don't have, for one, I mean, unless it's winter and you want the heat coming through, but during the summer, you don't want hot air coming through here necessarily. But if you got a transmission fire, now you've got a straight path from that transmission fluid fire coming up into here. Things like that. Not to mention dust. Yes. Like that's terrible. Mm-hmm. So a lot of it is common sense. In my eyes, it's common sense. A lot of people... I hate the term, oh, it's not a race car, uh, I don't need that. Well, there's a reason why race cars use these things, whether it's materials or techniques. And yeah, I'm not saying use it exactly their way, but use it as an example and adapt it as best you can for what you could afford. Well, you think about it, a race car is, when we take, we'll take a little Honda Civic for for example. You want to race the thing as fast as you can, but you're limited on funds. What's the first thing you're going to do? Strip the interior. Mm -hmm. So you think of a race car, they are bare bones with just the necessities. Mm -hmm. And most of those necessities, but people skimp out on and don't even think twice about it. They're yeah. not, you're not even realizing it, you know? Uh, it, it's crazy the times I've seen harnesses not, not looped right, like where these buckles are here. Mm-hmm. To loop them through but they don't uh double it back like back like this them. well like this one right here 
this isn't right. I need right. to go back through it again. Yep. Yep. Um, so little things like that. And yep. same with that one. Uh, it might not do anything 90% of the time, but that one ten percent where this does slip a little bit and you get play, that's what you don't want. And, you know. So PRP, when you buy belts through them, they actually say in their installation instructions to make sure you loop it back through. Every instructions I've seen for harnesses says that. I can only say PRP because that's who I have okay. experience with. Yeah, I, I've all, every instructions I've seen, and that's a big thing, read the instructions. <laughs> you know, uh, like <laughs> the safety disclaimer is all that, you know. Like, uh, I I love reading instructions solely because I can say I did it right. If if there's something wrong or if somebody comes up, oh, you should have done it like this. Like, hey, I get it. Maybe so. I don't know. But the instructions had to do this. This is how the manufacturer said to do it. Yep. Um, it gives you a better baseline than just winging it or going off your your great uncle's advice. You know yep. what he used to do in the in the shop when he ran dirt track. You know times are a little different. Yes. Um, I mean, there's so many things you can cover, but you know you don't want to hit anything hard with any part of your body. You. Mm -hmm. More and more people are getting away from suspension seats and racing because it allows you movement before you get to that stop. So they're going to more of a hard shell seat mm -hmm. because, yeah, on trail riding, these are more comfortable. But a hard shell seat in, from a safety aspect, it keeps your body more solidly planted. Okay. And so it depends on what you're doing with the vehicle. Um, these are great and even like a step up from these are still a suspension seat but they got the wings that come out to hold your shoulder in place mm -hmm. you know those are great for trail riding for racing you know some of it's personal preference and other part is what can fit in your vehicle sometimes you yeah you want to upgrade stuff you want to change things but your vehicle physically can't fit it and at that point it's you know do the best that you can yeah if you're building a vehicle from scratch know what you want to do in the future i want to run a hard shell containment seat in the future build it to fit that it might not be what you put in right away but be able to accommodate it later see i knew i was going to have some sort of these sort of seats in in this but wasn't sure i was still skeptical did i want to go with king ranch interior and like pull out of an f-150 or something which kind of fit the nostalgic of the jeep but then i was like man off-road it's just gonna freaking suck i mean and you could do that and do a bunch of those king ranch parts but then yeah. have these seats reupholstered as a king ranch seat right sit down girl <laughs> you know and so it kind of matches the look but the, uh, these, the functionality but you get that yeah, yeah these are going to be a lot Stand more functional and more comfortable like you might first get in a king ranch seat and be like oh yeah these are cushy but then when your butt's sliding around and uh you're you're having to physically hold your body over on a incline and later in the day your back sore your side sore you know you your your shoulder sore from hitting the the b pillar and uh you know, you think about those things you're like, wow, wow, I didn't even realize I moved around that much. But in a day of wheeling, whether it's eight hours or 24 hours, uh, you're going to find out everything your body hit because it's probably not <laughs> going to hit it just once. If your knee's going to hit this once, it's probably hitting it every time you hit a big bump, you yeah. know, it's, yeah. which is going to be multiple times. You're really going to feel it if you're 35. <laughs> yes. <laughs> God dang it, old man. <laughs> no, I mean, so similar thing, like I had... Um, I think they were seats out like an Astro van that were in here, maybe. Oh. They were like the big captain's chair that were just cushy and plush. I mean, on off or going off road, at the end of the day, I'm worn the fuck out. Yeah. I'm I'm ready to just lay in bed and crash out. But with these, I've wheeled a day in these and I get done, it's like, oh I've been in a side by side all day. Well it's Super because confident. you're not having to hold your body. You're not in place. compensating. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You're not uh fighting the movement so your body's not going side to side yeah, all day you, long the the seat is holding you in place and so you don't have to do that work right welcome to the mascot <laughs> you're in trouble hey who's nipping at me earlier see now she's like i don't know about you i don't know okay. turd let's <laughs> just trying to fight oh, oh safety like that. yeah see? your knees Where's your helmet, dog? <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean. So so let's talk helmets because we're going to have helmets and I'm trying to get with um, Axel. Mm -hmm. And uh, I haven't contacted him yet, but I'm putting together some stuff before we waste anybody's time. What is the clearance you want between your helmet and the roof? When Usually it's a minimum three inches. And why is that? 
because flex in the belts. Mm -hmm. uh, you can't take all the flex out. Uh, but you want to be able to sit there and move around and not hit anything. Like, e strapped in. But if there a, is a little play, you still want that. Also, if if there is a... I, I wouldn't call it a failure in a cage if it bends necessarily. It's a failure if it, like, breaks apart. Uh, if a chassis bends a little bit in a hard wreck, it's absorbing energy, and that's energy that's not moving into your body. So sometimes that's going to happen. Something has to give. I'd rather give a little bit than shear off like a tube, and then you've got a, a projectile that's trying to poke you or something, you know? But if something like that moves a little bit, flexes, bends, now you have that clearance too. But you want room for your helmet to move around and for anything to move around you and still not contact you. So generally it's three inches is what you want at a minimum. More okay. room, the better. Okay. I see a lot and I know everybody else seeing the, the flat top cages and the side by sides and you see the guy in there, he's literally like just a couple inches away from the, yeah. the roof. And you're like, dude, you, you roll over, this gonna hurt. Mm -hmm. Cause <laughs> uh, he's not by a bar, but he's right there by the sheet metal. So if you got three inches between you and the sheet metal, and this is a single layer of sheet metal or a single layer of aluminum, and you roll over and you hit a rock, there's not a whole lot keeping that from touching your it's skull. It's going straight through. Yeah. yeah. So uh, rather it doesn't penetrate it or if it just bends it, well, yeah, you had three inches of clearance now, but now this is right against your head. Imagine how much worse it would have been if you you started out right next to it, you know? Yeah. Well, and I'll trash talk boost cruisers a little bit. A lot of the boost cruisers are the typical guys that went out, financed it side by side, crashed it, got the insurance money. I didn't say this on the camera and then rebuilt it. Mm -hmm. So when they're out there trail riding, they're not caring about. It. They're still boost cruising. They're not wearing their seat belts. None of that. So when they wreck, it's like ten times worse. I, I I try to live by if if I get a vehicle and I start it up and put it in gear, I have a seat belt on. Mm -hmm. uh, very few instances I because I'm still human. You know, there are times where I'll I'll jump in to move it from this parking lot. Uh, well, I'm gonna go across the street real quick and park over there. You know, and I'll forget to. But I try to. No matter what, even putting on the trailer, anything, stupid things happen. Mm -hmm. Stupider things have happened than what you think you're about to do, or like the scenario you're thinking in your head, like there's no way this will happen. I'm sure there's there's something that is more far fetched than what you're thinking about that has happened and someone's got hurt. Right. Put a seatbelt on. Yep. Uh, there's there's stories from multiple times of people getting hurt or killed uh, uh, like that. Thinking, oh, we're just going from here to here, and then, oh, uh, let's do a donut real quick, and then something bad happens. Mm -hmm. And it happens so quick, you, you don't have time to react. Do some preventative work by just putting your seatbelt on. Right, right. Let's see, what else safety do we got in here? Yeah, this thing's not safe. <laughs> well, it's a project. I mean, yeah, it, it's good. Exactly, there. exactly. You That's why I was like, it's a perfect TJ? one. Yeah, we can go pick apart the TJ. Okay. It's, um, it's a little much of a disaster, but we can uh, pick it apart. That's something that I've not even had hands on yet. Well, it's good though, because I'm sure a lot of people have setups like yours with yep. the TJ. So this would be an example using yours for everybody else out there that wheels in a setup like this to say, okay, hey, maybe this is some, some, some stuff that I need to pay attention to. Yep. Well, here's one more thing on this, and it goes for anything: is know where your stuff is, know where your kill switch is, and know where your, uh, you know, your shifter is in an emergency you know you don't think about it but in even in a trail rig on the there are other podcasts uh i do see you on the trail we've talked about you know having somebody in a race car blindfolded and uh even like spinning them around like in a circle five times like around a baseball bat and then getting them in so they're severely disoriented and see if they can uh shut the vehicle off kill the kill the the power if there's uh fuel shutoffs like where they can reach you know whatever in an emergency they would do do it and get out of the vehicle safely and see how fast they can do it because i think a lot of people put this stuff in but they don't they don't do any practice on in a real world can i get out they don't of dry it? fire yeah and i think that's you know something you, you should do and training with your equipment is super important yeah you put a passenger in the seat and uh because they're a friend let them know, hey, the fire extinguisher is here, the kill switch is here, here's why. Educate your passengers on where this stuff is so that way if you get knocked off, they at least have some idea of how to try to stop the vehicle from moving or you know, put it in park or grab where a fire extinguisher is or something like that. Uh, I mean, cause that, would, that would really suck is if, if you're, you're as a driver, you know how to 
do everything and everything is perfectly safe or as safe as you can get it. Mm-hmm. And and then you're knocked out or you're injured and they can't do anything or don't know how to do anything properly right. and it takes too long um, and then something really bad happens. The, Shadow. Educate yourself. Educate the people that are going to be with you or and around you and yeah, uh, have stuff easy to reach. Easy to reach, safety equipment, power switches, whatever. It, it's better ever for everyone um if you want to put a secondary one as like a security thing like a so that way people can't start your vehicle off and run it do it but have one that is it within reach that anybody can see and reach and grab and turn off in an event um and save your vehicle save your life save someone else's life you know something like that even little things like i always carry a trauma kit every time i'm out mm-hmm. and it, it's just got like emergency like first response kind of thing just enough to get the ambulance there and take them to the hospital. But I always hang off the back of the seat or somewhere that's like easily accessible. And every time I get a passenger in, hey, trauma kit's there, shit goes downhill. Yep. You know? Uh, on the my JK, on the e-brake handle, I've got a, a seatbelt cutter zip mm-hmm. tied to to that or it's the it's the sheath for it. But I can it's right there. I can pull that out and uh for me or somebody else, like if it's saving someone's life or cutting a seatbelt harness, even if you're not sure, like if there is that much danger, it's a lot cheaper to replace a seatbelt than it is to, you know, so much medical bills. Yeah. Cut that seatbelt. Think think about it later. If you made a mistake, buy him some beer, pay for a new seatbelt later. I don't know, but I would rather cut the seatbelt, make a mistake and it not need to be cut, than not cut it because I didn't want to damage their, their equipment and then something even worse happened. You know, um, right. use your own judgment, be smart, but have that option where you can cut your way out of a vehicle, yep, uh, yep. It, especially in these off-road vehicles. And if if you don't take care of your equipment very well or you get some dirt in these, and it might might have been perfectly fine. Well, then you, you've you been wheeling in Colorado all, all week, and now there's dust in there, and you can't get this to release because there's weight on it and you're upside down. Uh, you have a seatbelt cutter within reach. You can go and you can cut yourself out. Um, uh, you can save yourself in instances where somebody else can't get to you fast enough. Right, right. Totally agree. So I'm going to hop out of here because my knees are killing me. And then we'll take a look at I'm surprised you stayed back there that long. Yeah, me too. My whole leg's numb. This is like that. I'm probably going to fall whenever I get out. You know? oh, oh, wow. I thought he was a funny safety guy. You good? You can get out. I like, there's I, enough light over here. Yeah, it's good. I looked at it uh, the other day when I was here. Yeah. And so, like right here was a prime example where <laughs> Jeep stuff. <laughs> this seat probably isn't what this cage was designed around because you got seat lift tabs poking right into the headrest of it. Yep, yep. And the shoulder belts are running down and forward. Okay, okay. So. Like this isn't ideal. Whether the seat's mounted too low or that, and I'm not saying this bar's too high either. It's just this routing is not I, ideal. Um, I would want that on top so I could see that they're wrapped right. Well, and they're also like over here. Yeah, they're like they're sideways. They're offset because this had a bolt in. Yeah. Probably before, um, they chained something up, and you can tell th- these are black. They should be black. Like yep. that's black. This isn't. So this is faded, you know. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily trust those because I don't know how old they are, what condition they've been in. I mean, there's there's tabs. Like, I don't know what those tabs are. But, I mean, as far as headroom goes, that speaker, not a good spot. That speaker needs to be somewhere else. It's not just your roll cage, but other obstructions like this speaker. These aren't, these are the four points. I don't even know if these have a... Yeah, these wouldn't have an SFI rating. And these are fine yeah. for trail riding. Uh, it's like a seatbelt style, seatbelt buckle style. But still, like, I hate if this that. is sitting in water in this seat right now and that gets rusted up and, you know, it gets stuck. But he's sitting in it right now, sit, sitting as if you're tied in. Like, there's no way his head's not going to hit on that. That's bad. Yeah. yeah. Those seats are angled a lot. They are, but, like, these, they kind of cut your legs a little bit. There's some that I've seen that, like, they'll angle them too much. It actually cuts the blood flow up to your leg. Oh, yeah. Well, it also depends on, yeah, like where your pedals are. Like, you, yeah. you don't want to be sitting up high and pinching off now. If your pedals are pretty up high and your legs are straight forward, like a Formula One car, they're almost laying down in that car. Yeah. That sits so flat in it, you know. It, it, 
you gotta be comfortable. This is a comfortable position. Like when you're driving this thing, it is definitely like you're, you're in it. You're not you're not being bounced all over the place. Um, so like this seating position outside of these tabs that I would redo and figuring out the harness routing, like he's got headroom for the cage itself. So yeah. Until I put a helmet on, there's probably right at that. Well, a helmet is going to be about that thick. Like yeah. you put a helmet on, you'd, you'd, you'd still be good in this. Um, pa the passenger side, not too bad. Um, if they scoot it forward, I don't know, you know, your knees hitting like the sharp edge there, you know? Yep, yep. And even then, like, uh, there's an SFI spec padding that uh, is, it's a really dense padding. A lot of people run like the foam that almost like what you wrap your pipes with in your house. Yep. It's really soft, but on a hard hit, you're going to, you're going to compress that so fast and so hard that it's not going to absorb any energy. The SFI padding uh, is initially it feels almost as hard as the the steel but in a hard impact it's going to absorb that energy and it's not going to compress and allow you to actually hit this and it's also i believe fire retardant too it's more expensive it's a harder material but it it's designed for this purpose use the right material right i mean like the fuel where's the so no there, the, there's no loop or any any type of routing for the vent. Yeah, nope. Uh, so fuels like if you get this up high, fuel's going to slosh out right right back here, and hopefully the luckily the exhaust isn't right there. <laughs> um, oh my god. <laughs> So sketchy. Uh, we get some, yeah. we, can we get a vinyl on this? It says final destination. <laughs> There's a so so this this is a factory tank, I believe, and it's got dual vents. But and there's nothing wrong with using a factory tank necessarily, but venting properly, you know, getting the height and the loops how you should, so that way fuel gets you want fuel to get trapped in the hose and not purge out in a rollover or a side. Like if right now, I bet you if we if this was full of fuel and we put it at a steep angle on the side, fuel is going to come out of one of these vents. I believe it. And uh, there's ways to route your your venting so that way fuel does not escape uh, or very minimal fuel escapes in uh, rollover or off camera situations, and that and that's what you want. So for the viewers that don't know, um, we actually are going to address these problems yes. before anybody hops in this um this is like i bought this and have not done anything to it um, i wheeled it once just to like test it out see how it's going to do and find like all the weak points like the transmission like the transmission um we're like this is going to get 100 percent gone through before anybody legitimately wheels it you've already got another fuel cell that we're going to put in yep. we're going to do everything proper uh as far as fuel line routing and everything um i'm already looking at you know where we could add gusket uh, gussets to the cage for strength and we've talked about putting a, a third seat back here i'll only do it if we can make it fit and it be safe uh you know moving simple stuff like moving the speaker you know yep, yep. and uh, honestly like i don't know how you are about sound bars i thought it would be a great idea to have a sound bar and this was in it when i got it um i don't like it uh, i like <laughs> to be able to have music but it's also there's times when you might want to turn it down so you can listen to somebody yeah. spotting you or something. I've never wheeled with music. Like if yeah. we're ever off roading, my dad was always like, "Radios off. We are listening to the sounds. Make sure everything's good to go." Oh, I'm like, I'm the TJ. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know. So I understand that, but I, I also like chill rides. Same way growing up. Yeah, but I like chill rides where I've got some music in the background. I don't like it to be overdrawn like most side by sides do with the big old tower yeah. speakers. What I don't well, like. You all also that, can't but... hear if uh, somebody else is coming, you know, and yeah. or somebody's standing and you you can't see it or there's an emergency uh you know there's there's a time and place and it, it, it's kind of up to you but you know uh i like music while i'm wheeling but sometimes i i do want to turn it down so that i can better assess the situation right i think for this one uh this would be the only rig i do it in i mean i say that i'll probably have a side by side or my waggy will have it too but i'm gonna put internal comms probably get rid of sound altogether and just whoever's in it can bluetooth their phone and, and whatnot and they'll have a headset because this has headers and exhaust and you know it's built to just go you can hold our record radios and see if they'll help us out with communications for the organization so 
I like rugged, although I have a Midland 55 watt for the Waggy. And uh, Heath has one too. We haven't tested the distance, but there was a video, I think Dirt Lifestyle maybe, or Trail Recon, one of those two did a video and tested it out in the Grand Canyon. And I was like, I'm sold on that. So it's I did that a, with the Ghost. VHF, VHF, Business Band. It's GMRS. GM, GMRS. Yep, GMRS 55 watt. And it has the uh, isolated mic with the Ghost antenna, okay. which is this little stubby, but it picks up like plus 3B gain yep. or something like Downside that. Downside of that is you're not going to get the same range as a big antenna. Right. Um, because their, their point of, the, uh, what, point of sight or point of view or... Anyway, straight shot. If there's a if there's a, a mountain between you and the other person you're trying to talk to, unless you got a repeater, uh, another a, a antenna on top that's then transmitting the signal, you're not going to reach them. But the more power you have, the more you can you can push that signal line of sight straight. You know, and my goal with it. So like in racing, you want that because you have a you have base camp that is or headquarters basically that is like reaching out to the racer out on the desert versus and, and they're using repeaters as well and trying to bounce traffic versus us on the trail where we're going to have max 15 people and we're all within probably one to two miles of each other at most and for the worst case scenarios um i've looked in like garmin and reach minis or something like that and they're just a little like um the plbs personal locator beacon that if something ever goes down like you need support you can click that and it notifies authorities and like sends out a mass text whatever the case may be so i've looked at those two a little pricey but i'll probably end up having one in every rig and then we're going to probably train everybody that gets in it like hey this is what this is for this is how you use it and worst case scenario you know and and because we're not having to reach back out and touch base camp unless we're racing so i think for our scenario that would work best well um, and even within a couple of miles you uh like five to 10 watt handhelds can reach a lot of that stuff uh, within a couple miles. Uh, with my 55 watt, I can easily reach two miles south of my house and we tested it with our handheld, my five, I think it's a five watt older rugged uh, handheld. Uh, it reached from my house up up to the Jeep from there. But you're you're limited if, if say, I, so I've got a 55 watt and a, and a five watt radio. I'm limited by what range I can communicate with that five watt by the five watt radio. I can only, I can only uh, listen to how, how far that range is. They can hear me from a long distance away, but their radio that my handheld can't reach. So I think it's about a mile and a half, two miles, and that's about the limit that that, that, that handheld can reach because it was broken up sometimes. Um, but just like anything, do your research, know what you're doing, and know the limits of your equipment, whether it's radios or your seat belts or your helmet or whatever, and uh, work within that. Let's uh, go back in the garage where it's a little warmer and not raining. <laughs> but yeah, this thing needs, like, we'll, we'll get it updated, we'll get it fixed, and have it at a good standard where I I know me, Chance, the other Seth, feel comfortable putting someone in this and, uh, and willing it and rolling it over. And uh, if something bad does happen, they'll be safe in it. So you had talked previously on, because we went over a little bit of safety stuff, but you had talked previously on... Um, Let me get on the other side. You guys, the sliding is atrocious. Um, there we go. On emergency shutoffs and whatnot. Yeah. So I educate anybody that goes out with me that I have one on this. But it's... it's right there. Yeah. That, that doesn't do anybody any good because right. the, nobody... There's no markings here or exactly. anything. You can reach it, but you don't know it's there unless somebody... Well, and what you. if there's a fire under the head? Exactly. So, I, yeah, I would put one either... I would put one on the dash... Mm -hmm. or like up here or something like that yep. and probably 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 on the dash somewhere somewhere in the middle of the dash so that way driver passengers can reach it and like road racing organizations you have to put a, a sticker on it that's like a, a lightning bolt symbol uh, with an arrow and it pointing to where your electrical shutoff is so that way course workers they look for that that symbol they look for that logo and look at where it's pointing and that's where they go for right so dirt fest um this the event we have coming up in may and some of the rules regulations that i've wrote you actually have to have a cutoff switch um and, and our crew needs to know where that's at so um just keep that in the back of your head if you're planning to attend and participate in the obstacle course we want to make sure that we can shut off your vehicle in case there's a rollover or something happens or fire and we know what's what we can um, look at um help just like 
most families out there, we have a cricket at home. Uh, we might be able to cut out some decals to put on or buy some buy some stickers that we can sell for, say they're do we buy them for a dollar a piece, we'll sell them for what we pay for them or maybe a slight markup. And My uh, girlfriend has a cricket too. Yeah. She's super good with the craft mm -hmm. and stuff, so I'm and, sure she uh, wouldn't mind helping. Put that on there just so that way we, like I said, you look, you look for that logo, and it needs to be within easy reach, in my opinion, of driver and or passenger, driver and passenger, and be able to be getting to from the outside of the vehicle. Absolutely. Thank you. We're gonna wrap up with some final thoughts on safety, so I'll hand this over to Seth Brown. I'd say a big part of it with safety is think about what your body can hit careful we can't be thinking it okay that gets us okay problem. okay don't think all right get in your vehicle see see what your body can hit and see what you can do to improve that uh know what your restraints are know what your seats are what their limitations are what they're rated for anything like that and think about worst case scenario to on the verge of doomsday stuff and in that scenario, would you feel comfortable in your vehicle? And if not, what can you improve? Little things like moving your fire extinguisher from behind your seats to somewhere on the cage or a firewall or something that somebody can reach it easily, you know, might save someone's life. Or if nothing else, you can reach it faster to get and then get out of your vehicle to go help someone else out. And I think that's a big thing is uh, just because it looks cool doesn't mean that's the way to do it. Um, and th there's so many ins and outs on safety that you can look at, but use common sense, wear your seatbelts. Uh, even if you're in the mud, I see a bunch of people that run mud stuff and they don't run seatbelts because they're afraid, I guess, if it rolls over, they're going to drown. But still, what good does it do if your vehicle rolls over and crushes you and knocks you out and you still drown? I would rather have my seatbelt on and then try to get out of my seatbelt than have the vehicle roll, roll over on top of me. But that's me. So be smart as you are able to be and have some common sense and um, look around. And there's a reason why sanctioning bodies require certain things. Maybe use them as a guideline. I'm not saying you have to do everything that way, but those rule sets are there in place for certain reasons and usually those reasons are because something bad happened so learn from those mistakes that or those incidents i don't necessarily want to say mistake because they're not always a mistake those incidences those accidents happened learn from them take those things that happened make your vehicle better make your whatever it is better your your willing experience better because of it um and then i want to close off by saying um, i i also do a podcast with alan o'neill see you on the trail one word and uh, we talk about off-road racing off-roading uh we had that's actually how chance and i met we had him on and uh go go look at that stuff like and subscribe or whatever youtube needs and I, i'm fairly new to the this world also it's only been a year so I know everybody says like and subscribe. So like and subscribe this <laughs> this page and uh, see you on the trail. And, uh, you know, hope to see you all again. And we'll, you know, get more in depth on some actual build videos and some hands-on, like, things that I would recommend doing for making your fuel system safer and, you know, Things along those lines, and um, that's, that's um, what I'm excited for. Uh, we'll go from there. You know, uh, I can talk a lot, but if I can actually do some hands-on stuff and show like actual ways of trying to make things safer, you know, I think that's the best way. I, I want to show anybody here's how I would do it and why I do it this way. Give some actual knowledge and education, and then move forward from there. Yeah. So Seth, um, he brings a lot of expertise to the team here at Reapwell. We're not just um, going out and having fun like we we want to make sure everybody's doing as safe as possible so seth is bringing a lot of knowledge to this team um but with this know that like the stuff we're doing the builds you see everything we're doing is the way we see fit it may not be how you do it but it's definitely the way we're going to do it so um critique all you want know that i, I let him nitpick the waggy and the tj 
for this scenario so that we can see how we can improve and go forward. So with that, like and subscribe, give us a follow, and we'll see you on the next one.